Welcome to all our participants. It is a real pleasure for me to uh, introduce our esteemed speaker today, Professor Daniel Batchier, who holds the Earl Del Greco Levin Professorship of Medicine here at Northwestern, where he's been, I, I believe, for at least 18 years, uh, maybe even longer. And uh, Dr. Batchier was the prior uh, division chief here at Northwestern and is widely recognized as an expert in acid base, electrolytes, hypertension, diabetic nephropathy, and has been working on the renin angiotensin system for a large part of his career and is internationally recognized. And of course, there's been a large interest in the renin angiotensin system in the time of COVID. And uh, Dan has really uh, been at the forefront with some uh, pieces, some editorials, as well as research going on in, in his own laboratory. Just a personal note, I think I first met Dr. Batchier back in 1992. I was a second year medical resident uh, presenting a potassium poster at uh, Kidney Week. Um, and it was a real pleasure to meet him then and even more of a pleasure to have him as a colleague now. So Dan, we are really excited to hear your talk today. Neither me nor Mitch Halperin were able to convince you to work on potassium, but you did a spectacular career and you are the world leader in nephrology and I'm very proud that you are our division chief. So today, uh, if I could advance the slides, which so far I can, I'd like to start with uh, uh, the before and after COVID. ACE2 was discovered exactly two, 20 years ago now, and with the help of Brian Bird, uh, he generated this beautiful curve where you can see the before and after. For the last 20 years, the number of publications relative to the totality of publications in the U European PMC, the equivalent of the PubMed, were relatively modest. But now, as you see here in the red point, suddenly in the first five months of 2020, you've seen this um, H2 is all over the place. So I really have more experience with what happened before than now, but I'm very engaged also with the coronavirus study. And I'd like to first start by saying what was happening before. And I have a slide here that shows the before and after. Before we were looking at the ACE2 like an enzyme that converts angiotensin 2 to 1.7 and angiotensin 1 to 1.9, and the potential implications in physiology and even preclinical, uh, potentially therapeutic applications. But now all of a sudden came the recognition that's the receptor for the COVID-2 virus, and in this after, that's what we are gonna have to talk today in the second part of my talk. So I was asked to address basic concepts, like what is ACE2, what does it do, where is it located, how to measure it, are there inhibitors, are there activators? So ACE2 is really a peptidase, a monocarboxypeptidase that hydrolyzes angiotensin 2 and other peptides. Because of its homology with ACE, has about 61% homology, the name Angiotensin converting enzyme 2 was coined or termed when it was discovered 20 years ago. And in this slide that Tony Turner, one of the pioneers in the field, gave me years ago, you can see the superposition of ACE and ACE2 and the homology very clearly. And one practical point that you need to know, because that has confused a lot uh, practitioners out there, ACE inhibitors do not affect or block the activity of ACE2. So what does it do? It hydrolyzes peptides with the renin angiotensin system and others. Here in the blue, you can see the amino acids is always the same amino acid, the arginine, cut by different substrates. H1, H2, apelins, apelin 13, 36, and then this arginine bradykinin and dimorphin A. Those are the known substrates for H2. Now, in the big picture of the renin angiotensin system, you can animate this slide. You are going to see that starting with angiotensinogen, the parent compound, 
you can see how angiotensin 1 is being formed under the action of renin. You have a decapeptide that under the action of ACE and a chymase is converted into angiotensin 2, an octapeptide and the main uh, peptide in the system. NH2 has to go somewhere, and then there are a number of enzymes that hydrolyze it to convert it into 1,7. Of those, H2 is the most potent, but there are other two, PIP and PRCP, that are also very relevant. Now, there are alternative pathways, and neprilysin can directly form angiotensin 1,7 from angiotensin 1,10, in turn, 110 can go to angiotensin 1,9 by the action of ACE2. 1,9 can go to 1,7 by the action of ACE. And ACE, again, forms angiotensin 1,5 from 1,7. On the other hand, on the other arm of the system, there are the aminopeptidases, of which APA is the most important and forms angiotensin to eight, and then three eight. So that's a little bit overview, but we are going to try to keep it simple because it's very difficult to integrate all of that in one talk. And let's just focus more on the next slide where you are going to see the simplest step, the hydrolysis of one eight to form one seven. And in a simplified scheme of the system, much the same way that we all know the therapeutic effect of either inhibiting ACE or um, blocking the receptors of angiotensin 2, it's very easy to envision a role of ACE2 as a potential therapeutic agent that would dissipate 1A to form 1,7. And because the actions of 1,7, generally speaking, are just the opposite of those from angiotensin 2, you go from a state of pro-oxidative stress, pro-fibrosis, pro-inflammation, to one where you have more anti-proliferation, anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrosis. So you go from the bad to the good. Now, ACE2 is mainly a membrane-bound enzyme. And in the full length, as shown here, is attached to the membrane that in the red is the transmembrane domain and is a relatively large molecule with 805 amino acids. It is shaded by shadases of which, aminopept, of which uh, Adam-17 is the best known. And then you have here a shorter version of it that is the soluble H2 that circulates in the blood. You can find it in the urine and other places. So where is now located? What is the location of ACE? It's essentially an epithelial enzyme. In the proximal tubule, you can find it in the apical border, as shown here in the center, and colocalizes very nicely with ACE. There is a rich angiotensin system here in the proximal tubule. So it's important to have these two enzymes coordinating the levels of angiotensin II and other peptides. In the lungs, as I'll show you in a minute, there is very little H2. However, there are these cells, the type 2 pneumocytes, that have some H2 and is also epical. And not shown here in the intestine, is also in the epical side. Now, this is a paper that we published with Peter Serfoso last year when we didn't know anything about COVID, but it was very interesting that we found that there was very little, if any, H2 in the lungs. The lungs have another enzyme called propyl endopeptidase, known as POP or PIP, which is also in the circulation. But H2 really is very abundant in the intestine, the testicle, but not in the lungs. I'll come back to this point later. The podocytes have some H2, and that's immunogol labeling that shows here the clusters of H2 near the podocyte, nothing in the endothelial site, in contrast to ACE that you can find it endothelially, but nothing in the podocyte. Using markers, this is an endothelial marker. Back then, Minghao Yi showed very nicely something that now is going to become important and perhaps controversial. 
we did not find endothelial ACE2, that's ACE, that is quite a bit of ACE in glomerular endothelial cells, but not ACE2. Another example of that in a renal vessel, a lot of ACE in the endothelial area and all ACE2 is outside in the tunica media and they separate perfectly. Now the question that people ask, how to measure ACE2? Everybody wants to measure ACE2 all of a sudden. Well, the techniques are related to either using the natural substrate, angiotensin II, or uh, use artificial substrates that are relatively specific, such as those listed here with these names that are difficult to, to pronounce. So all these methods are related to assessing enzymatic activity. But now people are interested in the protein, right? It's the receptor for ACE2. So for that, you have to focus more in immunohistochemistry, Western blotting, but you also can use the enzymatic assays in tissue homogenates. And finally, ELISAs are being developed, are commercially available. I'm not sure how good they are. ACE2 inhibitors, there are two. One is MLN for Millennium, the company that put ACE2 in the map and then folded many years ago. And another one called DX600. The main difference is DX is only recognizes human ACE2, whereas MLN is good and helps studies with both uh, mutant models as well as human tissues. What happens if you give it chronically for a number of times? Very interestingly, in the context of STZ-induced diabetes that already increases ACE expression in the glomerulus, in these animals treated with MLN, there was a very robust amplification. And here you see the endothelial ACE also amplified. An observation, however, that we have not been able to replicate in ACE2 knockout models. Activators, there are two. This is the work of Dr. Raizada that many years ago now, 2008, uh, with his computational analysis came up with two compounds, XNT and DICE, that are activators of ACE2, but very modestly, as you can see here. And in reality, when you test them, what we found is that either in the wild type, this is angiotensin II, hypertension recovery, which is accelerated by ACE2, unaffected by the blocker, and more conclusively, when you give this supposed activator to the ACE2 knockout, you get exactly the same response. So nothing wrong with these compounds. They are effective, but they are not ACE2 activators as far as we can tell. So now let's take advantage therapeutically of this uh, shift from angiotensin 2 to 1,7 that I mentioned earlier. Theoretically, there are many possibilities from acute lung injury to AKI to diabetic retinopathy, nephropathy, not to mention situations where you have high levels of angiotensin 2 in the circulation. And people has looked at these concepts over the last decade, and I'll just give you a little examples of what has been going on all this time. Approaches to achieve amplification of ACE2. The usual suspects. You can use gene delivery methods, lentivirus, now more popular adenovirus, delivery via mini-circle DNA, transgenic models, recombinant ACE2 proteins, these activators I mentioned a minute ago, and then recombinant ACE2 proteins that we have modified to have a shorter uh, molecular size, and I'll say a word about that later. So let's uh, start with the lung, and that's when the work of uh, Joseph Penninger, that's really has been the pioneer and the uh, man that really put ACE2 in the map, uh, did many years ago. He started with the heart, then he switched to the he switched to the lungs and now is back with the COVID story. So we have the ACE2 knockout and the wild type. And we look at lung injury by this criteria. And all you need to see that in a model of uh, 
acute lung injury induced by acid aspiration, you can see that this happens, but if you use recombinant H2 protein, you accomplish some protection in the well type and in the knockout. And as I said, by the scale, you can see that the knockout is already having more damage than the well type. So this, I'll come back to that because now people in critical care are interested in this topic. What about the heart? Cardiac fibrosis can be improved as shown in this study where you see all the blue for the cardiac fibrosis improved by lentiviral administration of H2. Another study more recently by Pan Lu where in the angiotensin II model, can accomplish hypertrophy really quickly in a couple of weeks. And when H2 is given, in this case, uh, fused with FC to ensure a prolonged duration of action, you have this very nice improvement in cardiac hypertrophy. From the same study, now using another model of angiotensin II dependent hypertension, the renin transgenic mice, that Sukwagan gave us back then, you can see that there is an improvement in blood pressure, which is very high to start with, an improvement in angiotensin II. That's a proof that you are dissipating it. Actually, you are dissipating it, you are giving it and dissipating it because you have the, all these H2 uh, floating around. And in this context, you can find an improvement of albumin excretion. But then the question comes up, is H2 an antihypertensive? And the answer to that, not really. It is an excellent hypertensive if you have a lot of angiotensin II floating around, but normally when you give it to mice under a steady state conditions, like here in the middle panel, H2 does not affect the blood pressure. When you give a bolus of angiotensin II, the blood pressure increases here by 40 millimeters of mercury. In the presence of H2, in the lower tracing, this is greatly attenuated because it's really dissipating the angiotensin II very fast. And in this uh, context, you want to know how much is the contribution of 1.7. Infused at the same time in the red, it does not change the recovery at all. In these studies back then that Jan Wasaki did in 2010, we measure the formation of angiotensin 1.7 in parallel with the lowering of angiotensin 2. And you have this nice increase in 1.7 that occurs in the presence of a blocker of 1.7, mass receptor blocker A779. So the contribution to the blood pressure effect as far as we can tell, is all the dissipation of angiotensin II, not the formation of 1.7. This is not to say that 1.7 doesn't have any other uh, fantastic actions, which I'm sure it does, but is not a strong antihypertensive. Back to the kidneys. In these original studies, when H2 was localized to the kidney, we found that diabetic mice has more A's in the glomeruli, but less H2. What a bad combination. Too much A's and not much H2. So it was obvious that we had to find a way to give H2. And uh, luckily at that time, we collaborated with Kevin, uh, uh, Kevin Burns, who had a transgenic and he did the studies in a model of STZ-induced diabetes. This is a podocyte-specific transgenic. You can see that the STZ-treated mice with a larger glomeruli, a little bit of mesangial expansion, and some improvement in the transgenic mice treated with STZ. There was also some improvement in the albumin excretion rates. So it seems that if you can uh, provide more H2 to the podocyte, you get some therapeutic results. So we continued this work, this time with the STZ model, but trying on our own 
to give a stew, tons of it, by mini pumps, by mini circle delivery, and nothing happened. There was no effect in GFR, this animal's hyperfilter, but treatment with H2 did not affect the glomerular size, mesangial expansion, or cellularity. So infusing it by this method, you have tons in the plasma, but nothing happens to the kidney H2 or the urine H2. So it was obvious that H2 was not getting to the kidney. So that's the time that Jan Wasaki took the scissors and start cutting from the C-terminal with the idea of finding shorter forms of H2 that would be short enough to and active, never get close to the catalytic domain, to see whether we can use them for kidney disease. And he succeeded with two, we are not done with that, but he succeeded with two forms of mouse H2 that have 619 and 605 amino acids, and they are still perfectly active, as shown in the next slide, by this protocol that we always use, where we look at the recovery of uh, H2-induced hypertension and very uh, dramatic effects of the two truncates, like same as the natural H2, um, natural H2. Now, we were able to get some help from the radio imaging facility here at Northwestern, which is a state of the art, to demonstrate that 740, the native one, sorry, does not get really into the kidney, whereas this shorter truncate, 619 and 105, both give you a nice rim, suggesting uptake by the kidney. And along these lines, now you can see some urine H2 activity when you infuse them. Nothing with a native one, but here you start seeing some excretion in the urine. And importantly, if you block the absorption by the proximal tubule using l lysine as a tool, then you have even more H2, which is proof that some of the H2 was taken up by the proximal tubule. What about H2 activity? There is a nice increase, unlike the native 740, when you are measuring in the kidney. And moreover, if you look at the ex vivo formation of 1.7 in the blue, there is also a nice increase in 1.7 formation. So in summary, up to now, all I can say is that there is really a role for H2 amplification in a spectrum of diseases from acute lung injury to maybe AKI, pulmonary hypertension, and others. And that I think we need to refine the approaches, at least as far as the kidney is concerned, using these shorter forms that are more likely to be directly down-regulating the RAS at the kidney level. But now comes the after. The after is uh, COVID, January of 2020. And let's now switch and see what's happening now when H2 becomes the receptor of the COVID-2. And we have to start thinking a little bit about how all this works. And then that's what I'm gonna do in the next uh, few minutes. Now we were be uh, luckily prepared because largely through the work of Fang Li, it was already known that SARS-CoV-1 uses H2 as the receptor. And that was discovered early on in 2003, and then demonstrated further by Fang Li in 2005 and 2013. And in this scheme, you can see in the green, H2, in the, the, the blue, you see the spike, the, the binding domain, the receptor binding domain, and the red, the red is the, the binding uh, motif of the receptor. So with all this information, things moved very fast in early 2020. It was again Fang Li that rapidly reported in January that, hey, it's the same receptor. COVID-2 is using the same receptor. Then came a very important paper here by Hoffman, 
where he said, wait a minute, the receptor interaction is all great and important, but there are all these proteases of which TMPRSS2 is the key one that's necessary for entry into target cells. Then came a race that we lost, but that's a long story, to get the cryo-EM structure um, defined that came by RAP in science in March. The crystal structure uh, was soon reported in this paper by Lan et al. And again, it's very similar to COBE-1, where you see the receptor in the green, the binding domain in the blue, and then the, sp the, the motif in the, in the red. So in a few months and within weeks, it's been really an experience to witness all this literature unfolding. Uh, we know a lot of what needs to be done about ACE2 as a receptor for COVID-2. So let's summarize that in a cartoon that we can visualize the implications of that. On the left is the binding. ACE2 is here binding to the spikes of the corona. And then comes the second step, which is the activation that I mentioned before by this protease called TMPRSS2. The activation creates a fuse complex that then can be internalized. And then the virus does what it's going to do. By the way, there is a beautiful video that I tried to attach. I don't know whether Ashley was able to attach or not to the presentation, prepared by the Washington Post, and that really shows that much better than I could ever illustrate. So now we have the ACE2 replicating inside the cell the way that virus do, and as a consequence of that, is that there is some depletion, uh, for lack of a better term, of ACE2 in the plasma membrane. Now that needs to be refined and studied better, but that's the party line as we speak, that you are losing a full length is to in the plasma membrane. So we could now with all this knowledge, the people that really understand that are working on that and trying to develop inhibitors of this uh, protease. Uh, there is one that I don't know how safe it is, it's called Comostat mesylate. So I don't know, but it makes some sense that one could intervene that way, the people that are interested in antibodies and vaccines are doing antibodies against the receptor binding site. And another approach that's called the decoy approach that we and others have proposed is the administration of ACE2 in a soluble form in generous amounts, we don't know how much, to intercept the virus from going to where he really likes to go to the membrane bound so that it can be internalized and start the process. So that's gonna be another venue that could be therapeutically very interesting and we would love to be able to prove that. Now, during these last few months, there has been almost an obsession of writing and talking about the use of ACE inhibitors and ARPs in the face of COVID-1. The idea is, are they good, are they bad? Because there are data that I'll show in a minute that ACEs and particularly ARPs can upregulate ACE2. Does that mean that now there'll be more receptor abundance so that the virus can infect in a more uh, effective or in a more uh, um, sustained way, if you wish, and cause more morbidity. But before I address that, let me say that all the societies, from the AHA to the American Society of Nephrology, the European Heart Associations, they all rapidly stated that no, you should not stop these agents because there was a moment of such confusion that even many pharmacies in the United States had started dispensing these drugs, ACEs and ARPs. And it was something of the social media, 
all initiated by a letter to Lancet saying that watch out, maybe we are going to do a lot of harm. So then, because everybody likes to be on the picture, which is the experience I'm seeing um, these days, everyone had to write an editorial saying exactly the same, in different words or even identical words, that no, no, it's safe to use these uh, medications. It was important to have a reaction, don't take me wrong. I mean, if there was a concern, it had to be addressed and not only there were these editorials listed here, but actually real data that amazingly was produced in a matter of a couple of months, starting, for instance, with this paper uh, from China, published in May, where actually they reported that hospitalized patients taking these medications actually were doing a little bit better. Then there were a couple of important studies, one in the New England here by Reynolds and the Italian one by Mancia, which larger number of patients and perhaps more complete studies that in, in, in essence, they said, as far as we can tell, it doesn't make any difference. It definitely doesn't do any worse, any harm. And that's where we are right now waiting for prospective studies, some are underway, which would be the, the proper way to address this issue. But let me know, go back to the question, what about ACE inhibitors, ARPS and ACE2? It is true that if you review the literature, and that now is again an older review that we did with Pepa Soler back in 2009, that both ARPS and ACE inhibitors, more ARPS than ACE inhibitors, tend to upregulate ACE2. And there are studies that I cannot show uh, in the interest of time that soluble ACE2 uh, it also increases in people with heart disease and Louise Burnell has done a lot of work in this area. I cannot cite everybody. But the point is, does that really matter? Does that really matter? Well, it depends on how you look at the data. In this study that we did in a kidney uh, arterials back then, you can see that there is ACE2 expression in the tunica media, nothing in the endothelium, and with tell me certain uh, ARP, we saw quite a bit of amplification. So you wonder whether this is going to really be more receptor for the virus. It was not such a crazy idea after all. But now, a couple of months later, and having thought more about that, I think the answer is uh, straightforward. What it really matters is the lung and very uh, specifically certain cells in the lungs. This paper just came out. It really shows exactly the same thing that we did last year, showing that there is very little H2 in the lungs. However, they had the clever idea of using alpha interferon and were able to upregulate H2 in the lungs. And next to it, they measure this important protease and is also there abundantly exp expressed. So in this context, if this is the target cell, if it were affected by ACEs or ARPs, then perhaps it would matter. So we have looked at that rapidly by looking at the effects of captopril and telmisartan in lung tissue. And I can report that there is no effect of either captopril or telmisartan in lung tissue. We don't have the precise cells, but taking the lungs as a whole, there is no difference. So we thought it was important to report that and we put it in biorex. I always criticize Biorex, but then I thought that was something that should be reported. The people in critical care ask a very important question. What about the use of angiotensin II as a vasopressor in patients in the ICU with COVID? So I thought I was not going to be able to answer the question alone, and I asked for help from the group that we have a group of H2 aficionados that is called the COVID-19 H2 
cardiovascular lung and kidney working group, which I'd like to acknowledge for all the discussions over the last several months, and in particular, Matt Sparks, who gave the answer. Here is the answer. Now, are we so sure, Matt? Let's be scientific. Let's not run into conclusions. Going back to the work of Penninger years ago, he showed that in the acid aspiration model, angiotensin II increases and with this acid aspiration, and hey, you have high levels of ACE2, low levels of ACE2, sorry, causing high levels of angiotensin II. Now that's experimental. I love to see what happens in the real world in our ICUs. Hopefully we'll have the right samples. But those are the mice counterparts. Another study that's widely cited showing that H2 in itself lowers H2, internalizes it. AT1 dependent effect blocked by Losarda. So, hey, too much angiotensin 2 means less H2. That's not a good thing. Maybe Matt was right. Then comes this other study that I like to show again, that's also widely cited, showing that when you look at H2 in infected and uninfected mice by CoV-1, the H2 knockout obviously has no H2, but the interesting thing is that the wild type infected also didn't have H2. So that's what people are saying these days, that the virus internalizes H2 and the plasma membrane becomes depleted. I like confirmation for this. So now comes AKI and almost in closing, AKI as a nephrologist, we all wanted to see what happens. Now the papers are coming out. It's a frequent complication. At least 30% of the people in the hospital and ICUs have AKI. Those in the ICU that have AKI have a high mortality rate. The figure of 70% has been cited. Maybe we are getting better as we speak, but still a very important complication. And we do not really know how it happens. It looks that it's more than just the bread and butter AKI. There are some features that suggest not only activation of angiotensin II, possible vital invasion, there is a complement activation. We have this huge hypercoagulable state that I think is at the center of all these COVID complications, the cytokine storm, a very complex uh, figure that was put together by Dr. Sunderman, uh, who is also part of this uh, ACE2 group of aficionados. So we have all of that and not a very good way to treat it yet, other than supportive care. I do not know if the examination will help, but I wanted to uh, add this slide that Dr. Kwan gave me, how Kwan here at Northwestern, to remind me, hey, then angiotensin II activates PI-1. I had known, but forgotten. And PI-1, in turn, decreases fibrinolysis, which is part of this hyper, hypercoagulable state. Again, in this context, if this is an important uh, action of angiotensin II, it's not a good idea to give angiotensin II to these patients. So what to do instead? I mentioned before these truncates that we've been working for the last couple of years or so, and we have tested one of them in AKA model of ischemia reperfusion. And I think the results are very relevant to COVID right now. Let me show you again the fact that this work that was presented by Mina Shirasi, which I hope is on the audience, not I'll be very upset, listening, that Mina showed very nicely that unlike the native 740 that's barely seen or not at all in the kidney, these short truncates are uh, filtered and taken up by the kidney. And using one of them, she showed very nicely something that was not known, that in the course of AKI induced by ischemia reperfusion, 
H2 is coming down. Much of what I said before may be happening to the lungs. And with the provision of a shorter H2, you can see that you are normalizing or keeping H2 in a normal range. Same with angiotensin 1.7. Suppress in the untreated group and the group treated with the short H2, a very nice increase in 1.7. And the clinical counterpart is that GFR measured at 24 or 48 hours was much improved. So we want to test that in our models now of COVID infection. And I think that's a very promising therapy. In closing, I want to go back to the initial slide and just imagine what's going to happen by the end of the year with all the explosion of paper and work with a stool. By year end, hopefully the epidemic will be gone. The pandemic, I should say. And uh, we'll know a lot more about H2 and uh, coronavirus infection. So thank you all. I want to, in particular, thank uh, Mihai, who has been with me for almost 30 years. Looks very young, eternally young. But uh, it's been 30 years, Mihai. And then especially to Dr. Jan Wasaki, who's really behind all the concepts and uh, experiments that are being done in the lab and all this group of students that in the last few years have worked with me. I can't wait for these two that are inseparable to come back, Mina and Bansa, and finish their projects. Hope, hopefully the traveling restrictions will be lifted and they'll come back and finish the projects. And I'm closing with a picture of my first grandson, which again I'm limited by the travel restrictions to visit in Barcelona. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Bonte, for that really informative and uh, wonderful presentation that had a bit of everything. Uh, we had GIFs and I don't know, Dr. Sparks, maybe it had ACE2 in, in every sentence. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia. We do have a few questions that have already come through uh, during the presentation. Um, the first one uh, we got uh, was a, a little bit earlier in the presentation. Um, so it said, are there any off-target effects of MLN4760, like ACE1 or other peptide ACEs? I suspect that there are uh, a little bit because this is a striking effect, for instance, that we found with this amplification of ACE in the vascular, vasculature and the glomerulus, we are not seeing in the knockout mice. So that could be an example of that. I am sure I, this compound was almost made the clinic initially by this company, Millennium. So they had done already some safety studies. So I cannot say that's really a toxic or anything. So I don't know that I'm answering the question, but it's not a compound that's been abandoned. It's just used right now in the lab as an inhibitor of H2. And possibly has some target effects of H2 as well. All right. Um, and uh... I forget exactly who didn't um, who asked that question, but if that you still need more clarification, feel free to to put that in the the Q and A um, or raise your hand and, and we can uh, we can call on you. Um, uh, next question we have: um, Prior to COVID nineteen, uh, ACE and uh, ARBs uh, were not widely utilized in kidney disease patients. Because of COVID nineteen, has there been a decline in clinical usage? I hope not. I don't think there has been because I get the whole thing lasted just maybe a couple of weeks. This panic that they shouldn't be used was a little bit of a hyper reaction and I'm sure that patients eventually got the medications and they are all continuing it. But yes, they were being used for the primary indications which are the cardiovascular, the diabetic nephropathies, and I think there hasn't been a problem they continue to be used. And I, actually now there are clinical trials thinking that from the moment that the infection is uh, prospectively, from the moment that the infection is documented, 
they may be protected. It's very possible that they are going to be protected. And I'm really uh, looking forward to the trials. One is out of Minnesota. Uh, I think there are a couple of three, but I think you know, we'll soon know. It's just a matter of a couple of months, maybe. All right. Um, next question. Uh, what do you think is the impact of ACE2 SNPs on susceptibility to acute kidney injury in the setting of COVID-19? I don't know. In this, I don't know. That would be the best answer I can give. I have not been ever impressed with anything that has been done trying to make associations in populations with ACE2 and risk for hypertension, although there are studies out there. But the best answer I can give you is that I don't know. I have one more question. Um, what is the likely explanation why the ARB effect to increase ACE2 receptors is not associated with a more severe COVID illness? Yes, that's a very important question. And I try to address it by saying that likely the few cells that are really critical to the receptor, which are these type 2 pneumocytes in the lungs and maybe some nasal uh, cells where the virus presumably enters, have uh, not, not affected in any way by the pre-existing use of ACEs or ARPs. But those are the studies that should be done. I mentioned our studies in whole lung, lung lysates that perhaps do not reveal the full story of what's happening to the type 2 pneumocytes. But look as a whole, the lung is not affected by the use of ACEs or ARPs, as far as we can tell. Therefore, infectivity should not be an issue. And keeping the good things, the protective things that these RAS blockers do, is important to retain the beneficial effects for which they were designed in terms of cardiovascular disease and so forth. Right. Uh, another question. Uh, can you expand on the root causes of acute kidney injury? Uh, I believe you referenced uh, coagulation as the cause. I wish I knew the answer. Coagulation is the most striking thing that the people, the real heroes that are seeing these patients, they see how the circuits are clotting and how there is real hypercoagulable state. I did not imply that angiotensin II was even a major player. I just wanted to say that perhaps it contributes to the PI-1 story and other activation of the complement. But somebody has to really unravel why is such a hypercoagulable state and how it affects um, uh, not just, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, complications in terms of um, uh, pulmonary embolism, clots everywhere, and may contribute a little bit to kidney disease. Some of the reports in kidney autopsies have shown some evidence of uh, microangiopathy. So more to, more to come, I don't know. Sorry, Ashley, I was asked difficult questions. Oh, no, you're doing, you're doing great. Um, I think uh, we have a few more minutes, so I'll let uh, a few more questions uh, come in. Uh, in the, the meantime, um, uh, we, I'll let everybody know um, that uh, if they'd like to learn more about future webinars, um, you can follow us on Twitter um, at NU underscore nephrology, um, or you can also sign up for our email list on our website site, uh, nephrohub.org, um, and there you can find other resources uh, and uh, events um, like this one and, and other things that we'll be doing. We'll be holding a virtual symposium in the fall and we'll be sending a save the date out for that soon. And our uh, core B, our therapeutic um, development and design core, will also be hosting a webinar uh, next month with um, some experts from our core and also Dr. Michael Eisen. So uh, keep an eye out uh, for that. Um, so it looks like there aren't any other questions. Um, if you think of any other questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Bache, um, I'll be sending out an email with how you can get in touch with 
him. And um, also, you can also um, add any questions in the survey that um, you'll be linked to at the end of the webinar. And oh, wait. Perfect, uh, we got one more question. Um, so the data to date uh, does not show an effect of ARBs to increase pulmonary receptors. Is that okay. the case? I know that's a key question is coming up because I guess it's an important question, but yes, I mean, as far as I know, we have only this paper in print or preprint showing that neither tell me certain nor captopril had an effect. But again, I hope somebody confirms that. Those are the key target cells and the one that really matter. Um, so like I said, you'll be directed uh, to a survey uh, at the end of the webinar. Please let us know how we did. And if you have any questions that pop up uh, between the end of the webinar and then, you can also uh, email, email us at nephrohub at northwestern.edu and we can answer any questions that way. And um, thank you again for joining us today and we will see you soon. Um, stay safe and healthy and encouraged. Um, have a good day, everyone. Thank you again.